On behalf of the NGO Committee on uh, Freedom of Religion or Belief and the Committee of Religious NGOs at the UN, I welcome you to this afternoon's event, Unseen Valor, Acts of Interfaith Courage in the Promotion of Freedom of Religion or Belief. My name is Bani Dougal. I'm president of the NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion or Belief in New York and the principal representative of the Baha'i International Community to the UN. And uh, to begin the program, I'd like to share with you the inspiration for hosting this event, which came from a recent act of generosity um, and bravery in Iran, where a prominent Muslim cleric, Ayatollah Abdul Hamid <clears throat> Masumi Tehrani, publicly gifted to the Baha'is of the world an illuminated work of calligraphy, highlighting a passage from the writings of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. This is a very courageous act, given the systematic persecution of the Baha'is in Iran. And in fact, this week marks uh, six years since uh, seven individuals, seven Baha'is who had been uh, serving as an ad hoc administrative group in the country, uh, tending to the affairs of uh, the Baha'is of Iran, which is the largest non-Muslim religious minority in that country. They were imprisoned, and they remain in prison on uh, charges of, uh, <clears throat> of espionage and uh, working against the interests of the state. And basically, they are in prison for their religious beliefs. On his website, Ayatollah Tehrani states that the calligraphy is a symbolic action to serve as a reminder of the importance of valuing human beings, of peaceful coexistence, of cooperation and mutual support, and of avoidance of hatred, enmity, and blind religious prejudice. He also says that Baha'is in Iran have suffered in manifold ways as a result of blind religious prejudice. And this, this act is an expression of sympathy and care from him and on behalf of all his open-minded fellow citizens. The artwork which is displayed over here uh, features at its center a symbol that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, that Baha'is call the greatest name, a calligraphic representation of the conceptual relationship between God, his prophets, and the world of creation. The artwork, which was prepared by the Ayatollah himself, as you can see in this slide, uh, took months to prepare and includes passages from uh, the Baha'u'llah's Kitabi Aktas, or the Most Holy Book for Baha'is, which reads, consort with all religions with unity and concord, that they may inhale from you the sweet fragrance of God. Beware lest amidst men the flame of foolish ignorance overpower you. All things proceed from God, and unto him they return. He is the source of all things, and in him all things are ended. At the UN, uh, discussions about uh, human rights and, uh, in particular, freedom of religion or belief often revolve around the role of member states and international law. However, we know that citizen action is equally important in upholding freedom. And this event today seeks to uh, highlight those individuals who've spoken out often at great personal peril to demonstrate solidarity with those at risk, to inspire and influence others to enrich the environment with unity and harmony. The symbolic gesture of Ayatollah Masumi Tehrani comes in the wake of some recent statements by other religious scholars in the Muslim world who have shared interpretations of the teachings of Islam in which tolerance of every religion is upheld by the Holy Quran. In August 2013, Mr. Mohammad Nurizad, a former journalist for the official Iranian government daily newspaper, Kehan, 
publicly demonstrated his support for the Baha'is in Iran by defying the fanatical view that Baha'is are ritually unclean by kissing the feet of a young child <coughs> and uh, through this courageous act of contrition of publicly kissing the feet of this young child whose parents are in prison for their Baha'i beliefs. Ayatollah Masumi Tehrani wrote to uh, Mr. Nurizad, noting that his act was an expression of respect for Baha'is, not so as acceptance of the Baha'i faith itself, but rather to be seen as demonstrating Mr. Nurizad's regard for the rights of all human beings, regardless of the religion they espouse, a principle that he states is upheld in Islamic teachings. Needless to say that the severe persecution of the Baha'is continues. However, these individual acts give us some reason for hope. This afternoon, we are going to hear about and share stories of similar actions that have inspired change throughout history, isolated actions that set in motion a chain of events. We are very privileged to have with us Excellency Ambassador Ferit Hosha from the Permanent Representative of the Mission of Albania to the UN. And Albania, as some of you might know, has been <coughs> declared as the righteous among the nations for the role that dozens of Albanian families played in saving Jewish refugees in the country during the Second World War. So I'm going to invite Ambassador Hosha to come up and sh share with us some stories. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Dugal, for this introduction, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm particularly pleased to, uh, to be part of this event and try and share with you um, the attitude of the Albanians during the Holocaust. Um, but before going there, thank you very much for the wonderful work that the NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion, our belief, is doing to increase tolerance and um, um, fight, eliminate discrimination uh, based on, on, on belief. Since the, when, since the end of the Second World War, some 6,000 books are written every year on the Holocaust. They document truthfully those dark times when human behavior was touching its lowest point, when a whole nation, a part of humanity, was sentenced to death amidst a terrifying collective indifference. Yet, very few books and testimonies have been written about the story of saving Jews in my country, Albania. Five decades of communist regime basically buried the story. We had to wait for the early 90s to have the first testimonies to timidly see the light. And during the last two decades, things have changed. Documents have been uncovered, rescued have spoken, they have brought to light their memories, and survivors have been um, identified. We do know more now, and I hope the world does, and events like this only help shed light on our modest contribution to humanity. What makes the story of saving Jews by Albanians a particular one is that contrary to every narrative related to Holocaust, what happened in Albania has no grievance in it. It is not, as it would have, as it be by definition, about death of innocent people in an effort to exterminate the nation. The Albanian story, to the contrary, is in its entirety a story of courage, of respect and love for the other. It is a story of life in an example of pure humanity. If there was one single fact to highlight, is that the entire Jewish community, everyone, irrespective of their social class, age, origin, or any other distinction, those already living in Albania at that time, or anyone coming from elsewhere, all, all were met in Albania with an open door, a warm heart, and were offered the secure shelters that many elsewhere refused them. Whatever the time, 
whatever the difficulties the country was through, and it has been through difficulties in its history, there is one thing to remember. There is no history of anti-Semitism in Albania. There is no existence of hate speech. There is no bigotry. Respect for others' religion, culture, and heritage has been a fundamental part of the Albanian society since ages, a value carefully transmitted through generations, something we dearly cherish and strictly observe nowadays as well. There were, thankfully, a handful of countries in Europe that stood up and saved thousands of Jews, and there were individuals which we honor today. But what makes the Albanian story and behavior unique are the four very simple yet meaningful facts. First, every member of the Jewish community living in Albania survived the Holocaust. Every Greek, Yugoslav, Austrian or German Jew who was lucky enough to get into Albania, either to stay or in its way to elsewhere, survived. No instance was ever found where an Albanian accepted any kind of compensation for helping Jews. Like no other occupied country, and this is probably one of the most important highlights of our story, Albania became a Jewish sanctuary, a Garden of Eden, and it had, at the end of the war, 10 times more Jews than at the beginning. So I feel, and you understand, particularly proud and privileged to be part of a nation which stood in the right side at the right time and took the right decision to appreciate and protect human life. Tolerance, generosity, loyalty, and integrity are values rooted since centuries in Albanian traditions, <clears throat> and they have always prompted us to stand for the other, to offer hospitality and shelter for those in need. How could it be otherwise when we Albanians consider that the house, the Albanian house, is the house of the Lord and of the guest? You just knock on the door and it opens. There is no need for, in, for any particular imagination to understand that those times and years were dark for Albanians themselves. Risk was high and threat was everywhere, and hiding Jews under Nazis' occupation was simply a death threat for the entire family, if not more. Everyone knew what would happen if the Nazis were to know that you're hiding someone they were searching for. Yet, all this would matter little in front of a superior need, that of opening their house and heart to those without shelter, that of sharing whatever little left with those hungry, that of offering protection by uniting in strong solidarity. The Nazis would repeatedly summon the Albanian authorities to provide lists of Jews, both as they were qualifying them residents or non-residents living in Albania. The Albanian government, it must be highlighted in an extraordinary act of courage, not only disobeyed, but it reassured local Jewish leaders that for as long as they were in power, they had nothing to fear, and they were warned, they were um, there were people who told them to leave at the right time before anything could happen um, by the Nazis. So Jews living in the cities, they fled to supportive Albanian villages, countries in the, uh, outside the main cities, and many times they adopted names of um, Albanians just to make sure that they um, were um, uh, living comfortably in, among, the among the Albanian uh, population. Christians and Muslim Albanians alike regarded it as a matter of national family and personal pride to help Jews, both native and refugees. And history has duly recorded that no Jew were turned over to the Nazis in Albania, and as I said, the whole community survived the war. In Albania, as in many countries, including at the UN, every year now we honor the exceptional courage of the righteous, and rightly so. But what is fundamentally different about the Albanian story is that Jews weren't rescued in secret by the exceptional good persons. We honor them and we are so grateful to them for what they did. But this story goes beyond that, beyond just persons. Entire villages, very often composed of people belonging to different religions, as the Albanian population is, 
knew everything about Jews in their midst. They knew where they were living. They knew who was helping, protecting, hiding, feeding them. And never, never any one of them was turned in. This is what we see an exceptional behavior of an entire society, whatever their social class, their origin, their education, their religion, or their belief. In 1987, two years before the fall of the Iron Curtain and three years before the fall of the Albanian part of the Iron Curtain, um, Gavra Mandil, a Jew rescued by a family in Albania, in the central part of Albania, Veseli brothers, would write to Yad Vashem, and I quote, in those dark days when Jewish life in Europe had no value of in or importance, Albanians protected the Jews with love, dedication, and sacrifice. And that was one of the starting points that um, the Albanian story began to uncover and to be recognized at the Yad Vashem where the country has now its place. Now, how to explain this attitude of the Albanians? So why? How did it happen? And, and what's the reason behind? Some have tried to explain this attitude uh, based on religious beliefs and tradition. And there is part of it. Others qualify it as a behavior inspired by ancestral rules. There is part of it. For us, Albanians, it goes way beyond. It is a deep sense of pride and honor a willingness to care for the other, a profound sense of, his, of hospitality to welcome, honor, and protect, at any cost, a guest or whoever in need, a timeless a readiness to help with whatever available that explains such behavior. And for all of this, we have just one word, and the word is Besa, B-E-S-A. And Besa means the promise. So when you give your word, you keep your word. When you make a promise, you deliver. And that's sacred for my nation, for my country, and for myself as well. So when I promise to other missions that I do something, they know that I will do. This is who we are. Four times, I quote, we opened our doors, what say the Veseli brothers in one of their um, statements in Yad Vashem. First, we opened the doors to the Greeks during the famine of the World War I. Then to the Italian soldiers who surrendered in 1943 to the Allies. They were fighting in Albania, but once they were no soldiers, they were helped to escape prosecution by the Nazis. And then the, we opened the doors to the Jews during the German occupation, and most recently to the Albanian refugees from Kosovo fleeing the Serbs, and that was in 99. So this explained the attitude. Albanians adopted this attitude not only for the Jews, but for anyone who was in need, who was seeking shelter, who was seeking for some protection and some help. Dear colleagues, the Holocaust was a unique crime against humanity that led to the notion and the legal definition of genocide through the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It has been 65 years that this legislation is in place, but has it really helped us all prevent the worst to happen again? The terrifying stories, and we'll certainly hear later on, of Rwanda, Bosnia, and, and, and Kosovo, just to mention a few, but also the tragic events that are hap happening now in South Sudan, in Central African Republic, openly question the world's ability to learn by past mistakes. Are we able to learn? Are we able to learn from our mistakes and not to repeat them again and again? We, we must remain vigilant because unfortunately, as we know, history repeats itself in its worst and that our first duty is to never forget. At least we can do that. Humanity will improve if we all individually will do so. If we will continue to learn from past tragedies and our own mistakes, if we keep up the memory of the brave and never forget the consequences of hate, discrimination, and indifference. And this activity and others like this can only help to do so. Thank you very much. And I'll be available for any question or comments later on, now or later on. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Excellency, for sharing 
those stories and uh, I guess it's it's doing the right thing. It's uh, a whole country on the one hand and then we have individuals around the world that have been stepping up and uh, taking steps often at uh, great peril to themselves to protect others. And we're going to hear from a number of speakers during the course of the afternoon, and then I hope we'll have a chance at the end for others to share stories and to ask questions and uh, for a discussion as well. But our next speaker at this time is Jacqueline Murakatete, who is an internationally recognized human rights activist and genocide survivor. Jacqueline has been speaking out for victims and other survivors of genocide. She was born in Rwanda in 1984, and she was nine years old when she lost her entire immediate family and most of her extended family during the 1994 genocide in that country. So I'm going to ask Jacqueline to come up and share some stories of uh, individuals who extended themselves to assist others and anything else you'd like to talk about. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I, I also would like to thank uh, Ms. Bani Dougal and everybody else who made it possible for me to be here and for organizing uh, this special program. I'm going to be speaking um, briefly about the men and women uh, who stood up uh, at the risk of their own lives uh, to protect their neighbors, their teachers, their friends. Uh, during the 1994 genocide uh, against the Tutsi uh, in Rwanda. But before I talk about those men and women, I would like to just begin by briefly talking about uh, the genocide itself, because I think it's important in order to appreciate the courage that was manifested by those men and women, uh, it's, uh, it's important to understand the environment and the context in which that uh, courage was uh, demonstrated. So as many of you know, uh, in between the month of April and July of 1994, uh, Rwanda experienced one of the worst uh, genocide uh, in documented history. Uh, this is a genocide that lasted for approximately 100 days. Uh, but in those 100 days, it's estimated that uh, over, two mi over one million people uh, lost uh, their lives. So the killings um, were very, very, very uh, efficient. And the killings were very efficient because this is a genocide which, like any genocide, um, was planned. This is a genocide that uh, did not arise uh, in a vacuum. Uh, although the killings began officially on the night of April 6, 1994, the conditions which enabled the genocide to happen uh, were created uh, in Rwanda uh, decades before uh, the killings actually began. Uh, the genocide, as we know, arose from uh, decades of discrimination against Rwandan Tutsis, the minority ethnic group uh, in Rwanda. Rwanda, before the genocide, as some of you may know, had uh, an ethnic-based ID system, an official ethnic-based ID system, through which they discriminated against Tutsis in schools, in the workforce, and certainly in the government. So growing up in Rwanda, I was aware that I was not only a human being, that I was not only a Rwandan, but that I was a Tutsi. And as a Tutsi, I knew that I lived in a country in which my people were treated more or less as uh, second-class uh, citizens. The genocide also arose from a history of anti-Tutsi narrative, anti-Tutsi propaganda, uh, which existed uh, way before the genocide happened. Uh, Rwanda, the then Hutu-led government, uh, before the genocide uh, had indoctrinated uh, Hutu children, uh, Hutus uh, in Rwanda, in this very dangerous narrative of Tutsis being foreigners, Tutsis being people who had come to Rwanda from other parts of Africa, specific, specifically from Ethiopia, and had 
control the Hutus. And there was this narrative of Hutus, so the, the government uh, narrative of Tutsis, where the government taught Hutu children that Tutsis were, uh, in fact, their enemies. That Tutsis were people who, whose only mission was to, uh, to control uh, Hutus. So grew, uh, growing up, Hutu children were uh, indoctrinated in this anti-Tutsi uh, propaganda. Uh, we also know that like the Holocaust and other genocides that have taken place, uh, the genocide was preceded by a process of dehumanization, a process in which uh, Tutsis were portrayed in the media, in the newspapers, uh, on the radio, not as human beings, but in fact as uh, cockroaches, which needed to be uh, exterminated. So uh, right before the genocide, and specifically between the years of 1990 and 1994, this type of uh, dehumanization process was very much a part of the, the Rwandan uh, 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 media. It was this uh, type of dehumanization um, uh, speeches and anti-Tutsi propaganda were uh, heard every day uh, on the radio and uh, also in the newspapers. Uh, when the killings began, uh, as I said, the killings were very efficient because they were planned. But the killings were also efficient because uh, most, most, the majority of uh, uh, Hutu civilians uh, participated uh, in the genocide. The killings were very, very personal uh, in that uh, most people were killed not by strangers who came from far away, not by uh, soldiers who were armed, but by their neighbors, by people who they had gone to churches with, by people who, uh, whose children had grown up playing with, uh, by people who uh, they had gone to weddings with, child naming ceremonies uh, with. So the killings were, uh, were very personal. And when the genocide began, uh, the then Hutu extremist government uh, made it clear that every Hutu in Rwanda was expected, was expected to participate in the killing, that it was a civic duty uh, of all Hutus to uh, participate uh, in the genocide. Uh, as you heard, I was nine when the genocide began, and uh, my story of survival, uh, like any other uh, story uh, of other survivors, it's, it's a long one. Um, but all I can say is that, uh, you know, when the genocide began, life as we knew it uh, changed. I was uh, forced to flee my home uh, and everything that I had known uh, if I had any chances of, uh, of surviving. And throughout the genocide, myself and other children experienced horrors uh, that no child uh, or no human being should ever have to, uh, to experience. And uh, at the end of the genocide, I learned, as you heard, that although I had been one of the few uh, Tutsis who had uh, survived, uh, neither my parents, nor my six siblings, nor my, many of my aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmothers had been as fortunate. Uh, in respect to my own immediate family, I would come to learn that one day during the genocide, uh, my Hutu neighbors had come and they had taken my parents and my six siblings uh, to a nearby river where they proceeded to murder them and throw their bodies in that same river. Uh, their only crime, of course, being that they were of the, they were Tutsis uh, under an extremist Hutu government which considered uh, being a Tutsi a crime deserving of, uh, of death. But uh, I survived, and I survived because of the few men uh, and women who stood up uh, to the government and who stood up uh, amidst the worst of evil and tried to, uh, to protect uh, people. Uh, specifically, I survived in an orphanage that was uh, owned and managed by two Italian priests. As many of you know, when the genocide began, many of the foreigners who were in Rwanda as diplomats, as business people, as uh, teachers, they, they left. They were evacuated by their embassies. Uh, but these two Italian priests were among the few foreigners who chose to stay in Rwanda at the risk of their own lives and try to protect um, children. And uh, throughout the genocide, the orphanage in which I survived was attacked. Uh, many times these two Italian priests, George and Eris, were um, threatened 
they were physically abused. But uh, every time they, uh, they were uh, called by the embassy and told that they could be evacuated and be taken out of Rwanda, they refused. They told the, their embassy that unless they could bring their children, like myself, who had a sat refuge in that orphanage, that they would not leave. And in fact, they did not leave. And because of their uh, uh, sacrifice, uh, myself and 300, uh, over 300 other children uh, survived in the orphanage. The story of uh, George and Eris, uh was exceptional but it was not the only story of, of courage during the genocide. You had a number of under other individuals who uh, risked their lives to, um, to protect people. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the story of uh, Carl Wilkins, uh, who is the only American who stayed in Rwanda and also helped to protect uh, people. Some of you also may be uh, familiar with the story of Romeo Dallaire, who sent all the uh, foxes and all the warnings to the UN Security Council telling them that the genocide was being prepared and that it was going to happen and asking for more support for more troops but instead uh, the UN ended up cutting the peacekeeping mission that was in Rwanda but he nevertheless stayed alongside uh, a couple hundred other soldiers and because of their choice uh, um, uh, a couple uh, people men women and children uh, also survived. Uh, but most importantly, it's also for me, uh, it's important for me to talk about the Hutu, men and women, uh, and sometimes children who stood up uh, and tried to protect their Tutsi friends. As I said, when the genocide began, the Hutu-led government of Rwanda made it clear that every Hutu was expected to participate uh, in the genocide. And they said that any Hutu who was discovered hiding, aiding in any way, uh, a Tutsi, that Hutu was considered a traitor, and he and his family uh, uh, would also be killed. So any Hutu who stood up during the genocide and tried to hide uh, a Tutsi neighbor, a Tutsi friend, a Tutsi fr uh, stranger in some cases, did so at the risk of his or, uh, and his own, uh, of his or her own life. And today, many of the survivors in Rwanda, myself included, will tell you that they survived because at one point during the genocide, uh, they met a Hutu man or woman or child who offered food, who offered a hiding place, who warned them of where the killings were happening and where they could hide. Uh, many survivors will tell you that at some point in their life, uh, in their uh, uh, fleeing and their uh, search to survive, they met uh, a Hutu uh, who did that. I have um, one particular story. Uh, of my own cousin uh, who survived because one of our Hutu neighbors uh, decided to, to hide her. Uh, my cousin was among the other Tutsis who were taken by, um, who were taken alongside my family uh, to be killed uh, at the nearby river uh, in our village. And she was uh, hacked with machetes and she was uh, thrown in a river. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, somehow the water uh, threw her by the banks and she was still alive and this man, this Hutu man, uh, came upon her and recognized that she was uh, still alive and he took her in and he nursed her wounds and for the, during the uh, entire genocide, uh, he hid her and he protected her and my cousin is alive today because that man uh, chose to go against the government, chose to go against the uh, the, the masses and try to do something that uh, he knew and he believed was right. And my cousin's story, as I said, is just one of, uh, of many stories. It is not the only story. And uh, I think for those of us who survived uh, after the genocide, as you can imagine, many of us uh, struggled not to lose faith um, in humanity. We couldn't understand how our own neighbors had done what they had done. We couldn't understand how the international community had remained silent as we were being ki killed. And we struggled to not lose faith uh, and hope in humanity. And I think it was the existence of these men and women who stood up during the genocide that restored uh, our faith in humanity because we understood that even in the worst of evil, there have always been men and women, sometimes children, who have stood up at the risk of their own lives 
and try to um, stand up for what was right. And I think as long as there are people who do that, there is hope, um, uh, at least for me. And uh, over the past few years that I have been speaking, it has really been my goal and my hope to be able to increase the number of people uh, who, uh, who do that. Uh, because at the end of the day, I do believe that uh, we are brothers keepers. And if we take that responsibility seriously, we will not stand by as people are being discriminated against and persecuted or murdered simply because of who they are, simply because of what they believe. Uh, and uh, I think that I always tell people, I always end by sharing one of my favorite uh, quotes uh, by um, uh, Edmund Burke, some of you may have heard of it, but the quote says that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men uh, to do nothing. And I think that given what has been happening uh, in our world, I think that um, uh, it is very, very important for us uh, to recognize the importance of, of standing up and speaking out whenever we see uh, acts of uh, persecution and murder. Uh, of entire groups of people simply, again, because of, of who they are uh, or when, uh, what they believe. And I think it's going to take the efforts of all of us um, to make sure that every human being has a right to exist and to believe in whatever that they want to believe in. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for sharing those stories and about the good men and women that did not stand aside and not do anything. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Borislava Manoljevic, and she is Director of Research at Seton Hall University's School of Diplomacy and International Relations. She's an expert <coughs> in conflict analysis and resolution. And she has worked on minorities and reconciliation-related issues with the UN and the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, in both Croatia and Kosovo. The experience of wars in the Balkans and uh, in the 1990s and her desire to understand the roots of violent conflicts have shaped her life trajectory and dedication to conflict prevention and peacemaking. Borislava. Um, so uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak. It is my uh, pleasure uh, to be here firstly because I think it is important to share the story. And having lived through a conflict in the Balkans and seeing lives shattered, it is important to tell a story of individuals who have uh, chosen peace, who have chosen uh, a different path in the midst of conflict and in most constraining circumstances. So, um, uh, first slide. So, uh, I will speak here both as a scholar um, and as a conflict uh, resolution practitioner, uh, but also as a person who uh, lived through war. Because I think that we need to understand why some individuals groups and societies choose peace uh, and what what can we learn from those cases um, today I decided to speak about Central African Republic because the conflict there is uh, ongoing and it's not that visible it's not that present in the media um, this conflict is described as a conflict between Muslims and Christians as a religious conflict. So Qatar is a country uh, where ethnic and where ethnic and religion, uh, religious cleansing on a massive scale is actually taking place. So there is about 20% of the population uh, that, is, that is being displaced at this moment. Um, the percentages are, there, there is 15% uh, of, of Muslims 50% of Christians and 35% of, of uh, people who, who have uh, <coughs> indigenous beliefs. So the nation of, of uh, Central African Republic has been engulfed in conflict uh, both before and after the Muslim rebel group Seleka overthrew the government in March in 2013. So um, uh, the Seleka particularly targeted Christians 
in villages across the country, uh, which led up to a coup. Uh, in response to this violence, Christian militias, anti-Balaka, emerged. And these new militias began to hunt down Muslim populations uh, in retribution for, for these Seleka's actions. So hundreds uh, uh, of Muslims have been murdered and hundreds of thousands were forced uh, to flee the country by these militias. But in the midst of this conflict, two religious leaders are working together to end this bloodshed. So uh, we, have, we have the Imam, Umar Kobin al Avama, who sought a refuge uh, at the residence of the Archbishop, Diodone Nizapelenga, head of the Catholic Church in Kar. He sought a refuge in, in Archbishop's uh, house after receiving death threats from this anti Muslim militia. But what's striking uh, is is what both of these men said. They said that the conflict is not about the religion. And the proof is their friendship. So this reminds me uh, of Bosnia and Croatia and, and conflict there that is often, that was described as an ethnic conflict. But before the conflict and after, people had intercommunal friendships, they had intermarriages. So it kind of, counteracts that argument that it was an ethnic conflict. The point is that uh, religion, ethnicity, gender, race, all these identity markers are used to incite conflicts. They can be used, however, for both good and evil. But eventually, it is the people who have the capacity to choose. Another story that I would like to uh, point out uh, is the story of, of Father Xavier Fagba, who said, we cannot be silent and cover in the face of injustice, but we must have courage. To be a Christian is not just about being baptized, uh, and true Christians live a life of love and reconciliation, not bloodshed. So Father Fagba, who is a, a religious leader in his, in his town, in his community. He's the leader of the congregation uh, of the town of Boali in Kar, and he had uh, plenty of opportunities to decide whether to encourage peace or revenge. As the anti-Balaka group started atrocities and ethnic cleansing in his Boali uh, community, they started ethnic cleansing of Muslim population, Father Fagba went house to house um, asking Muslims to join him in the church, to seek shelter in the safety of his church. So his efforts so far uh, have protected around 700 Muslims from, from Buali village. So when we talk about acts of courage, we actually talk about the basic human capacity to choose between good and evil, to choose between being a bystander, a follower, and someone who intentionally chooses to take the responsibility to make peace uh, or take a different path. However, these cases are rare and they represent a departure from a common patterns of violent and conflict behaviors. But they are important because as, as we heard today, they can lead to a variety of transformational outcomes that are important for peace. Such cases also represent seeds for different types of relationships and reconciliation in the future, in the post-conflict period. So what have we learned from, from these cases? Uh, are these acts of, of Father Fagba in, and, and uh, Archbishop and Imam in vain, are they just a, a drop of water in the ocean? They really did not stop violence in car. I don't think so, because acts of choosing peace in the midst of violence provide an opening for a new set of relationships, a new set of relationships with the enemy, with the other. But choosing peace in the midst of conflict can be dangerous, as we heard. 
choosing peace. Um, the, the stories of, of our archbishop and imam in, in Kar uh, reveal that they were threatened, that they were shunned by their own community and their own in-group. Uh, why is that so? Well, it's because these individuals are destabilizing conflict systems. And conflict systems are closed, non-interactive, biased. These systems do not allow questioning. They tolerate correctness only of one story. And in Kar, the story is, in order to live in peace, we need to get rid of Muslims. Or in order to live in peace, we need to get rid of Christians. So it is usually us who are correct, good, and victimized. While the others, the enemy, is wrong, bad, aggressive. The others who are placed outside moral and political order, um, they, they, are, they are objectivized, they are dehumanized, and therefore violence towards them is justified. Such systems, such conflict systems, are almost incapable of self-correction unless humans develop intentional responses that can destabilize them. So a true sustainable peace comes about when somebody in the system is able to imagine a way to create a discontinuity in these vicious, vicious cycles of revenge and violence and act upon it. This is a choice that an individual, a group, or a state makes by adapting to the new situation and by learning from past mistakes and past experiences. So what, what these stories have shown us is that to act responsibly really means to act respectfully towards the other. To act responsibly means to learn and explore why the other or others sometimes do not positively reciprocate our actions. Responsibility cannot only be seen as external to human beings, it does not only reside in laws, in international policies, in responsibility for protect, um, in, in religion, in tradition, in rules, but it is also internal to human beings. Responsibility is the capacity to choose an option that would work best for all. For all. So we need to recognize that we do have this responsibility to choose an option that would work best for, for ourselves and the others. By recognizing the archbishop and imam stories, we are recognizing the existence of better options by making them visible and accessible to all. It should not be forgotten that it is often the other, the enemy, that we must continue living with, sharing both time and space. So it, is, it was the case in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Croatia, in South Africa. We need to recognize that we do have the responsibility to choose the best option that would work best for, for both us and our neighbors that we need to share this space with. Um, well, the responsible and courageous action that we saw from the stories of, of, of these exemplars show actually that peace is a working process, that it demands dedicated efforts during and after conflict, but also in peaceful times. We cannot know the other unless we are curious, all open and ready to learn. The other cannot be reduced to objective knowledge and our horizons of knowing. The other is a mystery that is revealed through the relationship that suggests inquiry, self-correction, adaptability. So learning about the other does not imply a reduction of differences by seeking commonalities and sameness, but actually acceptance of those differences. So the, pro the proposed concept of, of relational responsibility that I would like to finish with is inclusionary, even the ones en enemies 
that relational responsibility demands forgiveness as a way to break the ties that bind us to the other's violence, to our neighbor's aggression, enmity, envy. And it illuminates the fact that current conflicts cannot be addressed through violent means, but through sustainable and legitimate mechanisms that promote dialogue, learning, and inquiry with the other at interpersonal, national, and global levels. Thank you. Thank you, Borislava. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we now hear from uh, Dr. William Wendley, who is the Secretary General of the Religions for Peace and Chair of the Committee of Religious NGOs at the UN, who is a co-host of this event today. Dr. Wendley is known for his work in advancing multi-religious cooperation to help resolve conflict and has been engaged with multi-religious peacemaking efforts in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Liberia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Iraq, and other countries. He has served as advisor to many governments on matters related to religion and peace, and currently serves as co-chair of the US State Department's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group. Bill. Thank you very, very much, Bonnie. Uh, and to the uh, NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion and Belief, Bonnie, you're serving as the president. Uh, we applaud, as your sister committee, one of your sister committees, the leadership you've taken uh, to bring us together and to prepare for this event. Um, I think that the um, title of our event, Unseen Valor, is, uh, is, is particularly touching. It, it touches our hearts. Um, I'm convinced from 25 years of work in interreligious uh, field, particularly in areas of conflict resolution, that this is actually present in a profound way. And um, many of the people that don't stand out as visibly as some, nevertheless, uh, shouldn't uh, be folded necessarily into a, a total complicity. There's a lot of contradiction in our own hearts, and I've seen so many people uh, so remarkably giving in the hardest of situations. I'd like to give four examples. They move a bit across time, and I was had a mind about uh, the religious diversity of our shared earth. The first, uh, close to our last presenter, um, is uh, taken from Banja Luka, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and I'm speaking about an experience where I was present in 1995. We can recall together that the Dayton Accords were signed just one month earlier. And I think we also have to recall that the three largest communities of Bosnia-Herzegovina experienced themselves in some parts of Bosnia to be victims, and at least some members of those same communities uh, no doubt partook in a victimization of their own communities. It's a hard thing to say, but I think we have to say that. The actual scene I bring our attention to is one in where I was standing beside Bishop Franjo Kumritsa. He's, he's the, he was the Catholic bishop, still is, of Banja Luka, in his bombed cathedral. Most of the churches, Catholic churches, were destroyed or damaged. The Muslims fared uh, much worse. Out of 219 mosques, 219 had been dynamited. The bishop gave me a piece of advice. I think it was wise advice, and it served me well for the last 20 years. Bill, he said, you must always try to stand with the religious leaders in the community of majority. Well, I didn't know what he could mean. I was standing with him in his bombed out cathedral, and in effect he was saying, Bill, you need to stand with the uh, religious leaders of the community who have ethnically cleansed this area. He challenged uh, my IQ, and what I refer to by IQ is my irony quotient, the ability to, to recognize 
often that what seems like the most obvious thing to do is exactly not the right thing uh, to do. Um, later that same week in that same town, I went to visit the, the Mufti, Mufti Ibrahim, Ibrahim Halalovich, the central mosque uh, which abutted the square of the center of the town had been dynamited, but a small house, which was his office, remained standing. So I went to visit him, and I experienced uh, such uh, uh, startling uh, quietness and gentility as he described his own love for his own multi-ethnic and multi-religious Bosnia-Herzegovina. The only counterpoint to his uh, stunningly quiet and gentle voice were his hands, which he could not control. They shook uh, visibly throughout the conversation. Uh, this dear man uh, passed away uh, uh, not too long after this of a massive heart attack. Uh, but again, in the midst of such hardship, uh, a personality of this kind of caliber. I round out this very, uh, this story to share that only a few months later, uh, I was in Belgrade and meeting with the patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox Church. And there the proffer was to ask the patriarch to support the building of an interreligious council. Now the war has ended, but the wounds are profoundly deep. They're not at all healed. And of course there were many in his own uh, camp, his own fellow bishops, who would have opposed the founding of such a council. But the patriarch supported it. So I found in all three of these communities uh, stunning uh, leadership, uh, valor that didn't hit the headlines. In fact, what hit the headlines were all the errors, mistakes, abuses that transpired across the different communities. Come with me then to one more, and here we go to the bush in Sierra Leone. It's 1998. Recall that Sierra Leone was gripped by a brutal civil war that lasted from 1991 to 2002. In 19, that's more than a decade, so it's a very protracted, uh, brutal war. In 1997, the, the Revolutionary United Front, the RUF, attempted to kill President Kaba, and an unbearably brutal stage of this civil war ensued. We remember it because it hit our headlines. It was the hand chopping as the message back to the government. No, we're here, we're not going, we'll prosecute uh, our own case. Uh, even informal channels were now broken between the RUF and the government, and negotiation would have simply been impossible. Nobody had the credibility to, in a sense, negotiate the suffering of their respective communities. Enter the Interreligious Council of Sierra Leone's Women of Faith Network. Muslims and Christian women. They went into the bush completely unarmed with one strength. They were women, and in this case, they were all mothers. And they negotiated from the RUF the release of 50 child prisoners. When the children greeted the women, they said, you're like my mama, because these were children that had been taken from their homes. Uh, these remarkable women uh, brought these children back to President Kaba, thereby enabling the president to open a window of dialogue, not yet negotiation, but dialogue with the rebel forces. Uh, again, uh, um, many, many vicissitudes as that conflict continued to go forward and finally uh, reached a, a resolution. Uh, but I, I'm one who believes that if the women Muslims and Christians together hadn't done what they had done, uh, that the path would not have been as direct uh, to finally a, a solution. Uh, a third example, this time Jaffna, Sri Lanka, December 2007. Uh, recall that in Sri Lanka, the conflict uh, in that country began in a sense in 1983 with intermittent insurgencies uh, by the liberation tigers of Tamil Ilam. They, they were fighting to create an independent state. Uh, again, just to recall, the, the Sri Lankan military defeated, it was a military defeat, 
of the, of the Tigers in May 2009. Beginning in 2006, the government launched major attacks against the Tamil strongholds, and these included the strongholds in the north. Uh, the great fear was that these attacks would place in jeopardy the entire Tamil population, civilian, who in some ways were, were entrapped by the, by the tigers themselves. In late 2007, in the height of the conflict, the Cambodian supreme Buddhist patriarch, patriarch or venerable Tep Vong, traveled to Jaffna, the Tamil city in the north, um, to meet, yes, to stand side by side and to meet with Sri Lankan Buddhist leaders willing to meet with their Hindu, Muslim, and Christian Sri Lankan counterparts. So what was he doing? And recall the wisdom that uh, 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 the bishop gave me when I was standing in his uh, bombed out cathedral. He was using all of his authority as the supreme patriarch of a neighboring state. Huh? Uh, to say that it is truly Buddhist to reach across religious and ethnic divides even in the midst, perhaps especially in the midst of a civil war. And he had his own credibility beyond his high office. During the Pol Pot regime, he was murdered and pushed into a ditch, except that he didn't die. And then he, spent, he has spent and continues to spend his entire life to rebuild the Buddhist Sangha in Cambodia that suffered so traumatically from the Pol Pot uh, regime. When I asked him in Jaffna how he could make sense of it all, he responded, it's simple. In Buddhism, we are called to replace hatred with kindness. So here's the IQ, the irony quotient that I was referring to. It really took a Buddhist from outside of Sri Lanka to be able to stand with those uh, Buddhists within Sri Lanka who needed the moral legitimacy of one of their own to tell the wider uh, Buddhist community, this is Buddhism. This is what we do as Buddhists. And this is true really for all of our respective um, religious communities. Um, quiet valor, yes, I would say, although Tep Vong would just say it was being a Buddhist. Now, finally, I invite us to Holmes, Syria, March 2014. Last month, a bishop from Holmes, Syria, was in my office discussing the child protection centers that Religions for Peace is privileged to help the religious communities in Syria to build using mosques and churches as the base. These are little centers where all the children in that area can go and get meals and have a little bit of education and they can mix as communities. The bishop told me that he was invited uh, to go to the largest uh, Islamic center that was functioning in his area. But as we all know, the, the, the populations are moving. There's a lot of uh, external people in the area, a lot of violence. So he was strongly advised not to go. Bishop, it's simply too dangerous for you to, to go to the Islamic Center. Well, he decided that he should go. So he went, and he had to give his little remarks. And when he was prepared to, uh, when he had concluded and was prepared to, uh, to leave, he, he heard the imam say, Bishop, don't leave. And he confessed to me that it, it uh, caused him some anxiety. He was a little bit apprehensive just to have gone there. So he stopped, and the imam came and stood next to him. And when the imam was next to him, the imam called out, daughter, calling to his little daughter, six-year-old girl, daughter, come here. Come stand here with me. And then he told his daughter, daughter, kiss the hand of the bishop. And then he called his son. I think he wanted to make a point to all in the room. He called his son a couple of years older, and he said, son, come here. Come stand here. Kiss the hand of the bishop, which both children, of course, did. Uh, when the bishop was speaking to me, he was weeping. 
And this is the kind of solidarity and unseen valor we don't read about, we don't hear about, but we know uh, uh, to be the expression of our faith when we encounter it. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should say that having listened to uh, William Wanley, my twin brother, I don't think you need to listen from me. I mean, uh, I do share whatever he may have uh, shared with you <coughs> this afternoon. <coughs> but uh, let me at the outset say, say that I would like really to express the appreciation uh, to the committee uh, of uh, religious NGOs and the NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, for convening this event. Uh, I thank also Baha'i International uh, for uh, its hospitality. Uh, civil society organizations continue to provide a critical uh, leadership in addressing global challenges, including those associated with uh, restriction on fundamental human rights, uh, such as uh, with respect for the rights to freedom of religion or belief and to freedom of expression and opinion. And these rights are strongly linked, as one cannot truly exist without uh, respect for the other. Uh, during this event, uh, as you did say, we have uh, had the opportunity uh, to listen to accounts of individuals who had the bravery uh, to speak out to defend these two fundamental rights. Uh, and I have uh, immense respect uh, for what they have done, speaking out against violence, intolerance, and discrimination is never easy. And they set, I would say, an example uh, for all of us. In many countries, and uh, we heard about uh, some of them today, as you said, uh, freedom of expression and freedom of belief uh, are curtailed to the point that those who resist such restrictions uh, are risking to lose their lives. And in too many other places uh, today, uh, hate speech against minorities or marginalized groups is prevalent and when it is not challenged, uh, contributes to creating a climate of suspicion and mistrust uh, that create uh, divisions between different ethnic and religious communities. Myanmar, where the Rohingya community continues to be stigmatized as not belonging, and Ukraine, where uh, hate speech based on ethnicity has been ongoing, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, are just two of the most salient uh, examples of countries where hate speech is pervasive. In the worst cases, uh, hate speech uh, can incite violence, uh, signaling the risk that atrocity crimes could be perpetrated against specific groups. Uh, this has been the case in Myanmar and more recently uh, in South Sudan, which I just visited a uh, couple of days ago, uh, where the state radio was used to call for violence against members of a particular ethnic community, as well as in the Central African Republic, where incitement to hatred against Muslim has been associated with brutal violence against the community and has contributed to what has been termed ethno-cleansing, ethno-sectarian cleansing. All these cases uh, demonstrate the dangerousness of hate speech. And we cannot afford to keep quiet in the face of such outrageous violations of human rights. We all have the duty to speak out and to act. And the price of silence is too high. And for this reason, it is my uh, firmest belief that events like uh, this one uh, offers a unique opportunity 
to learn and reflect about our potential to defend human dignity. Uh, the people we have heard about uh, should become our role models, our champions, and uh, guide our actions. Let us be inspired by them to speak out and to act against intolerance, discrimination, and violence. Speaking out takes courage, uh, but that courage is not a prerogative of a few individuals only. It is a treasure that is hidden within each of us. Courage does not need a big stage to perform. It can blossom in our offices. It can blossom in our backyards. It can blossom in our neighborhoods. Wherever it is evident, it can impact positively in the lives of the people around us. Courage is like a flower that blossoms in the concrete. Uh, it can foster human dignity by challenging stereotypes and stigma, and in the best cases, it can save lives. History teaches us a lot about courage. During the Holocaust, many people in Europe risked their lives to protect Jews. During the Rwanda genocide, Jan just remember, remembered us, it was also uh, many individuals uh, who, through their standing for human rights, save, were able to save many Tutsis uh, who were uh, about to be killed. And uh, those uh, who took those actions, they bravely choose to hide those people who are at risk. And more recently, I was impressed when I heard uh, about the action taken by a group of people uh, from a small village in the United States and precisely in Florida. Uh, those people uh, decided to stand up against the hate speech of Pastor Terry Jones when uh, he threatened again to publicly burn Koran on the anniversary of 9-11. And this was, as you remember, in last year, in 2013. And I learned that their courage, activism, and perseverance were essential in preventing Pastor Jones uh, from burning the Holy Koran publicly, an act that would have most probably uh, triggered another wave of violence worldwide. But I would also like to salute the wisdom and the courage of uh, Ayatollah Abdul Hamid Masumi Tahrani, and I do echo his call for religious coexistence with Iranian Baha'i. And as stated last April by Imam Ibrahim Mogra, uh, who is, uh, as you know, the Assistant Secretary General uh, of the Muslim Council of Britain, and I quote, the Ayatollah has done something unprecedented in Iran. And he said also that Islam has a history of defending minorities, and protecting their religious rights and freedoms. Imam Mogra reminded us uh, that Caliph Umar, when he ruled it uh, in Jerusalem, he did answer that Church of the Holy Sepulchre remain a Christian place of worship. And I conquer with him that Ayatollah Masumi Tehrani shows us that Islam's peaceful legacy is not just history, it must also be the future. I'm sure that there are many, many more stories to be told 
of cases of unseen violence. Yet, many of these remain buried in silence. These stories, the initiatives taken by courageous individuals or groups, or individuals who have decided to stand up for human dignity, are essential if we are to learn how we can win the battle against intolerance, discrimination, incitement to violence, and ultimately, atrocity crimes. And therefore, these stories should not be unheard. At the institutional level, I know of a number of initiatives by non-governmental organizations to tackle intolerance and incitement to violence. For example, uh, Article 19 is organizing a conference later in the year uh, to look at best practices for preventing incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. And the United States Holocaust Museum is also developing guidelines for countering hate speech. My office, too, has developed policy options for the prevention of incitement to violence uh, that could lead to atrocity crimes. And later in this year, we will be organizing a forum with religious leaders representing all major religions and faith, as well as religious minorities, to discuss the important role that these leaders can play in preventing atrocity crimes. And I would like here to seize this opportunity to thank once again uh, William Wenley, uh, who uh, made a very powerful statement uh, last November in Vienna during the assembly of uh, which grouped more than 600 religious leaders. And I uh, just uh, received uh, two days ago his important statement regarding uh, our uh, daughters who were kidnapped by this bandit of uh, Boko Haram. And uh, I should say that uh, many eminent personalities are already playing this role, fighting prejudice and fear uh, to bring communities together. And we hope that uh, the forum will be convening before the end of this year uh, could result in a code of conduct for religious leaders that could be used in situations where there is a risk of atrocity crimes. And I'm sure that uh, there are many other similar initiatives, and some of you uh, may be involved already in those initiatives. So my dear friends, brothers, and sisters, as I conclude my remarks, uh, I would like to reiterate that it is through our enduring faith in our common humanity and in the value of human dignity that we can achieve societies premised on equality, justice, and peace, and through our action to promote this faith. Let us all be that flower blossoming in the concrete. Let us all have the courage to speak out in defense of all our neighbors and join the fight against hatred, discrimination, and intolerance. Let us reiterate today our deepest commitment to unseen valor so that we can build a global culture of respect based on the acceptance of our differences and a world free of atrocity crimes. And I thank you for listening.